Hey everyone, so we're here at VCF East with Joe DeCure who worked both at Atari on developing the Atari 8-bit systems and with Amiga consulting to help start development of the Amiga. Right, when it was High Toro. When it was High Toro, yes. Well, I met Jay in person in late February 1976, right? I was interviewed by other Atari people over the Thanksgiving weekend in 1975. By luck, I had been studying microprocessors on my own. I had bought a 6502 at Westcon the same day that Ron Milner did. So I aced the technical interview, but I hadn't met Jay yet. So I went up to Nevada City, California to debug what would be the 2600 concept prototype. Management liked it, so they said, you're coming down to Los Gatos to work for somebody. So that's when I met Jay Miner. I rented an apartment nearby, I bicycled in to work. And the, my first day at work there, I talked about writing some memo and he talked about ass covering and he said, you know what? Success has a thousand fathers, failure is an orphan. He was the most important mentor that I've had in my life, bar none. Favorite boss. I miss him all the time. He died at 56. He was a young guy. Kidney failure. He was tall, affable, funny. He was a square dancer. He did bonsai for fun. Every time I'd go visit him, I'd hang out in his bonsai collection. We'd talk. Well, you worked with him twice, but first was at Atari, and that was on the 2600 and the Atari 8-bit computer. Right. And then he left in February of 79, because Ray Kassar came in in January of 79 and told us how we're going to sell computers to women in designer colors. The women who worked in engineering at Atari left after that because they were insulted. Um, and Jay said, I'm done here. So he went off to go design pacemakers, okay? I stayed at Atari long enough to make sure the QA testing was solid for the 8-bit computers, and then I went off to chase my dreams, which were to anchor the internet with dial-up modems. Jay calls me up in September of 1982 because he has decided to form a new company, which was called Hi Toro. Hi Toro. He was badge number two. Uh, Dave Morse was badge number one. I became, as a consultant, badge number three. Mitchie the dog was badge zero. So we worked on the design of our next system, the one that we conceived of on my last day at Atari in June of 79. We started talking about what the requirements were, and Jay Miner was being told by Dave Morse, I want a machine that can animate cartoons in hardware. So we thought, how are we gonna do that? So we, the next stage of animation machines was, um, how can we do in hardware what's done in software? Now, shortly after I was hired, they hired a guy out of Apple who had worked on the Macintosh and who understood what the software people were doing to do what they call bit blitting. Well, these things implement hardware bit blit. So you can take an image and a background image and a third image, which is basically the selector. If it's one, take the foreground. If it's zero, pick the background and push it all together and put it out. The Amiga can do that in the time it takes to reference the memory. It's that quick. Amiga can touch 60,000 pixels per frame. Right, and two frames so make it, up a screen. If right, if you're, if you're in interlaced. Yeah. And the later machines were non-interlaced. What we discovered was that if we put digital interlaced stuff, it would drive people crazy. Once monitors became popular, it was better to non-interlace them running faster. I basically did, given the requirements from Jay and Dave Morse, 
came up with a system architecture that modeled, was an extension, a clean extension of the Atari 8-bits. So for example, we used a more powerful processor. We used a peripheral I.O. adapter that was generic, same part in fact, but the machine that manipulated addresses, the Antic, became the Agnes, and it did 28 DMA channels. Like four of them for audio, one of them for communications, one of them for disk I.O., four of them for the, the bit blitter, um, eight channels for the sprites, one for you know DMA, one for the coprocessor. So we did a whole lot of DMA with that machine. We took the concept of something that scooped up all the DMA for video and made it cover more things with more, more extensive palette registers, right? Like the palette registers on the Atari did basically the color on the wheel and intensity. But analog TVs also have a color intensity as opposed to the, the grayscale intensity. They call it tint control back in the old analog TVs. So we had 12 bits in the palette registers rather than eight, right? So we went farther. Also with the Amiga video output, Daphne, we did color compression. We said, okay, we can put out a color choice and illuminance, and we can vary the color intensity. All those washing effects we get, right? We added color compression there in the Amiga. So like the Atari 8-bits, there's an address DMA machine, there's a video capture machine, and there's another machine, third one, that does non-video I.O., that does the disk DMA that does the audio DMA, captures the data from the Agnes, that um, captures the data for communications, stuff like that. Now, is some of that compression responsible for the ham mode we find on the Amiga? Well, does the, you embed the data that's interpreted by the Daphne that tells it whether or not you're just choosing successive um, palette registers or whether you're holding two of the three data solid and slowly varying the third component, whichever it happens to be. Now you say that they wanted a machine that could do cartoons in real time, but I know there's interviews with Jay that said he wanted a machine that could do flight simulators. Well, we did that too and we did, but I'm first of all quoting what Jay and I were talking about in the boat in October of 1982 when he was listening to Dave Morse who had been a vice president of Tonka Toys. He came from a toy company, not from a computer company. So he's thinking about what does it take to entertain all those kids? And this is a time when VCRs were very expensive. So at that time in history, late 1990, 1982, Amiga is selling, then Amiga, is selling goodies that are used in the Atari 2600 game market to self-finance. They don't have big venture capitals. They're, they're trying to bootstrap it the hard way. And so what hurt Amiga a lot was, in late 1983, the 2600 game market started disintegrating and their revenue evaporated. I was working for Jay as a relatively expensive consultant bringing that back to my startup in Berkeley and splitting my money three ways with my other partners, keeping them alive. And they couldn't afford that. So they laid me off in late 1983. But after I was laid off, they started hiring regular staffers like Dave Needle, who continued the system design. So I was there through the paper specification of the system. If nothing was in hardware at this point, right. everything was, it was just being paper. drawn out. Because we didn't have personal computers, so it was paper. A bunch of C D size and, and E size hand drawn stuff. 
I imagine a lot of that was doing those sort of block diagrams. Was there also block, work? No, I was doing not only block diagrams, but I was drawing, you know, little boxes and and circuit symbols, all that stuff. Oh, so that would and that would actually go on to become a schematic potentially. Right. Those were the no. Those were, those the, were schematics. the schematics. Okay. And then somebody else would take those and start building chip layouts. They built first of all TTL designs. Dave Needle did a whole lot of converting those original MOS diagrams to TTL diagrams so they could build a logical emulation so they could start doing software development. And that would be those multiple boards everyone yes, knows of I've as got the Lorraine I've got a prototype. photograph of some of those giant wire wrapped assemblies. You know, my students nowadays don't know what wire wrapped looks like. <laughs> it's alien to them. Now once they went to a badged employee because you say you were a little expensive for their finances. Do you have any other involvement with Amiga at all? After that, I was, out, I was not only out of there, but after 1984, in the middle of the year, when Tramiel sued Jay Miner personally for theft of trade secrets and patent infringement, I had to become invisible. So I vanished from that space so that Tramiel wouldn't know I existed. I had to become invisible for right. decades. Four years ago, they had the Amiga 30 exhibit in Mountain View. Me and Ron Milner presented the Amiga hardware. I finally got to meet Dave Needle and RJ Michael and all these other Amiga heroes that I didn't get to know because I wasn't allowed to because I was going to get sued if Tramel knew I existed. Can I see like, where your signature is on the inside of the 1000? It isn't there. It's not there? No, because they, I had left. Remember I had to be invisible? I'm not there. So you're the invisible signature in the lid of the Amiga 1000? If they had, if it was safe for me to be discoverable, I probably would have signed it. But, you know, there are a whole bunch of expired patents that have got my name on it. I still want to get an Amiga working so I can finally start experimenting with the Amiga hardware audio synthesis system. It's a four channel sampler. I mean, the Atari 2600 has a programmable noise generator and the Pokey is a four channel programmable noise generator. But the Amiga thing can take four samples from memory. Each sample can be from one pair of bytes to 8K bytes, sample it at variable rates, variable amplitudes, times four. So with an Amiga sound system in principle, you could have a rhythm track, and a bass track, and a melody track, nice. and captured audio sound. They did a demo where they captured Mitchie barking and they hooked it up to a keyboard so they could have Mitchie barking and Mitchie yipping and all in between. And they could play four channels of Mitchie making dog sounds. It was hilarious. The first big pivot we had was we were trying to design a machine that would have been a very powerful animation machine with 32K bytes of RAM, rather than shipping with 128 or 256 or 512K. We were originally thinking about an animation machine, not a personal computer. The collapse of the video game market said to us that we had to pivot towards a computer. And we ended up designing a very powerful machine, but Commodore Marketing, was selling it in toy stores. Right. You don't sell an Amiga 1000 in a toy store. But at that time in history, in the mid-1980s, IBM PC is owning the market for personal productivity. Apple Macintosh is trying desperately to sew up the artist-oriented market. And here we are with the first preemptive multitasking multimedia operating system. We were 10 years ahead of Mac OS 
and 10 years ahead of Windows 95. Marketing was not competent to sell that machine. I'll tell you where the thing was successful. People built the Amiga 2000. We built the Amiga from scratch so that it could synchronize with external video. So they built the, there's a name for it, and I forget the name of it, toaster, the toaster. So they built the toaster, so Amigas with toasters started showing up in TV stations all around the world. They would shoot the weather person in front of a green screen, and then would computer generate the background, put them together in the Amiga, there's your weather channel. Success has a thousand fathers. Then in a well-organized, well, organized organization, it's engineering and manufacturing and marketing and sales and tech support and product QA and all these other people that it takes to make successful products. Somebody comes up with an idea, you want, in my opinion, good engineers have to talk to marketing. And I define marketing, they're not the people who decide what color the ads are or staff the trade shows. Marketing knows the answer to the question, what are you selling, who's buying it, why are they buying it from you? So I expect young engineers to cooperate with real marketing once they've found it. So companies that do that will innovate, will make up new stuff that customers actually care about. Um, so that's creative, and then there's a whole lot of work involved in building a product that's actually useful and presentable. Uh, a prototype is not a shippable product. There's a whole lot of stuff that has to go into quality. We were trying to license the Amiga chipset back to Atari to use in coin-op, not consumer products, not to compete with Amiga, but to use that power in their other systems for which they were spending lots of money and making a lot of money. Right. The Amiga was quite capable of world-class animation at that time. They didn't have hardware bit blitters that would do what Amiga would do. The thing that strikes me, we have modern animation machines, right? So like, just to go back a little bit, the PlayStation 3 has an IBM cell processor. It has one general purpose processor and eight rendering engines. And they can render the zits on your face, <laughs> right? But the question is, does that help? What I would want to build um, is, what I would imagine, but it could be done in software, is a machine that's specifically designed to enable artists to create what I would call retro video games that are substantially simpler in terms of complexity. If you want to write a commercial video game today, for an Xbox or a PlayStation 4, you're talking about hundreds of men and women years to create these games. I'd like to see people enabled to create a game in a season or two on stuff that they can afford and sell those to other people who can afford those machines. That would be fun. Now, this could be an emulator. It could be a system that runs on top of a Raspberry Pi 3 because that's got the compute muscle, right? And people have Amiga emulators that run on Linux, they run on Raspberry Pi 3s. The idea is to make an artist's canvas that's simple enough that it's handleable by small numbers of people in a reasonable amount of time. So what are you up to now? What am I up to now? Well, let's see. I finished my regular career three and a half years ago, the week I turned 65. So nowadays, first thing is, I teach electrical engineer at University of Washington part-time. Second thing is, I play bass in a band. I still am interested in retro stuff and I'm trying to figure out, I have a book to finish, things like that. I'm trying to get my old Amigas to work. I have a three 2000s with 3020, a 6020 add-in cards. I have a 3000 and I have an A500 MIST. A500 MIST works. So I've recently, like last fall, discovered the Seattle Retro Computer Society. So I am busy getting the Amigas to work. I'll figure I'm happy when 
at least one of them works and has not only a working rotating hard drive, SCSI hard drive, but an SD card as well. Then I want to start <coughs> relearning C on that platform so I can fool with game development and music development. I'm also working on a draft standard for DC microgrids. 80% of the world has AC in the walls. The other 20% of the people in the world have no electricity. And I'm working on a standard for how to deliver them electric DC power. And having worked on dial-up modems that were a success before they faded, Bluetooth, which is still wildly successful, and USB that's still wildly successful, I'm willing to put in all the volunteer engineering effort to prototype something that's going to make a difference for sustainable development in the world. Thank you very much, Joe DeCure, for uh, speaking with us today. It's great to hear You're from welcome. you. I'm glad to be here.